My name is Mbali Noko, your host, as always, every Tuesdays and Thursdays at 8 p.m. Um, today we have another exciting episode with a familiar face in the uh, uh, farming podcast uh, here um, on the private property channel and uh, we've had this entrepreneur a few months back and I can definitely say that his business has definitely grown since we've had him on the podcast and I'm quite excited to learn about how his operations have expanded, how many farmers he's working with, he's assisting in the industry as well, and how his journey has been like as an agri as an agri entrepreneur um, throughout 2020 and 2021. It's been quite a tough economic climate for the fresh produce industry. So I think if you're a farmer looking to know about market access, how to penetrate different markets, whether it's retailers, whether it's export markets, the do's and don'ts of a farmer with dealing with buyers, I think this episode is one for you that you'll find quite insightful and informative. And before we get on to the show, I just want to re- re- remind you that we have an echo buzz competition where private property has partnered with echo buzz and uh, where you have to go back to our youtube channel under the farming podcast playlist have a look at all the series that we've aired so far under the gardening series uh, in partnership with home growers tell us what you've learned in either of those episodes and use the hashtag gardening series echo buzz and private property by telling us what you've learned for you for you to win uh, the prize it's a nurture product hamper I think it's valued about seven or 800 rand. So yeah, I think it's quite worth it for you growing your own food at home. Well, let's get into it. Tonight's topic is all about accessing market opportunities as farmers. And uh, joined, joining us today is Zamogutle Twala, who is the founder of AgriCool. Zamogutle, thank you so much for coming back onto the show once again. How are you doing? Hello, hello. Thank you. Thank you for having me, Mali. Um, I'm very excited to be here again. Yeah, thank you. I'm doing well. Awesome, awesome. So let's start at the beginning. Since you last came onto the show, you know, you were just running your business, trying to expand, you know, um, dodging some certain challenges or overcoming certain challenges. And then I think a few weeks after you came onto the show, you won an award and uh, had some a, a, a prize as well. Just tell us about what has transpired with AgriCool since you last came onto the show and where the business is now. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Yeah, uh, definitely. Our company has grown and we're very fortunate to, to get some grant funding from, from, from SAB Foundation. Uh, if it wasn't for that grant funding, um, I think the company would have died Like because we were out of runway, we had no funds. So um, they did help us a lot because they also gave us um, world-class mentors that have helped us. And uh, when we met, we were just trying out doing a lot of experimenting. We're not too sure what you're doing and how do you go about building a business, building a team, but uh, through SAB Foundation, not just because of money, but we got some great mentors. And I would proudly say that as a we have reached product market fit, we, we've got some revenues, we've got some consistent revenues, we've got customers, yeah, so yeah, so and the company has grown very big. Like you say, our team has grown. Uh, I think from from a, from three to ten to ten people to ten employees. So we've grown significantly, and our revenues yeah, have also grown. Wow, this is fantastic to hear. Yeah. So tell me, with the growth of the team, like what are you focusing on as Zamabuche as part of uh, you know the the lead in the company, and what type of strategic skills have you employed? to obviously beef up the work that AgriCool is doing? Yeah, sure. Obviously, it varies. Um, firstly, um, uh, uh, I, was, I was a solo co-founder, solo founder rather, so I had a lot of challenges and I couldn't do things on my own. And I was very fortunate to, to get Balisa. Um, she's my co-founder. Um, yeah, she joined the company and she's our COO. She runs the operations. And so now I get to concentrate on just playing golf and she does the rest. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But um, yeah, so uh, I concentrate on business development. We I talk to the buyers, getting more deals, but she also run operations, strate- uh, look at strategy. Um, and also we, because now we have, we have grown, we're trying to streamline some of our processes, which means that's when the tech comes in. We spend a lot of our money uh, also getting a product manager, someone in house to talk to customers and talk to users, uh, like farmers, okay, we want to pull this thing, how should it look? Do you want this button here? Will we solve this problem? We also had some field officers as well, the guys who do deliveries and 
or to do quality assurance, to go to the farm and look at the quality, is it right? Uh, are we handling the produce the right way? Uh, sales, sales person as well. Yeah, so we're looking at those. Yeah, at, at those. But uh, the key ones I'd say, which which even made my life easier, was getting a COO because when we hire, we, yeah, we actually made my life a little bit easier because now oh. I had more opportunity to leave the office and do meetings and meet stakeholders and yeah. try and get more deals and try and get more business. Right. So yeah. when you came to the show before, especially talking about markets, a lot of your clientele were farmers who were were coming to agriculture saying that they don't have markets. And um, I remember you were selling to informal traders at that time. Is this still the case um, where you're buying from farmers and selling to formal tr- informal traders? Or have you expanded uh, the business clientele to maybe uh, pursuing opportunities with retailers, with processors, with exporters maybe? So how has the business grown since then? Yeah, no, but like I said, the business has grown. It's, it's grown up uh, very, very big. So what also happened was that uh, at that stage, we were working with the informal markets. We had a few retailers. Um, so what happened was that um, uh, we then, uh, with the informal market, we mainly use it for the emerging growers, those guys who are still starting up. And the reason behind that is that they've got a lot to learn, especially if they're doing packaging, how do you do it? And maybe they like infrastructure to do some of the things. And also, uh, the medium size to commercial growers, we also use them to, to look at the premium market. So we put you a stage when you come as a farmer, we don't just link you with the buyer, like say with the big buyer, because we don't know how you're going to perform because it's also risky for us as well, because we need to maintain that relationship. Mm. So we still serve the informal market, um, which is mainly your, your imagine your small growers. If someone with like say quarter of eggs, how they've got cabbage, got quality or spinach, peppers, depending what product line they have, they're not linked with those guys as they grow. But also even if you're small, but you've got the right quality, you've got the right systems, you become more confident uh, in mm-hmm. working with you. So, um, but now I'd say um, our business is quite balanced between the former and informal. So yeah, mm-hmm. so like 51, 49. Yeah, so we look at our revenues. We still very much, dominant in, in the informal markets because that's also our key differentiator from our competitors because they don't do informal market. We think it's, it's a very big market and yes. there are a lot of opportunities there. And, and especially looking at from an APK, uh, like a pan-African perspective where, uh, uh, where, uh, it's, where black people, like black growers are producing to, to supply black uh, hawkers who also sells to the black end consumers we think mm-hmm. that's brilliant we need to see more of that because it's our mm. it's our african markets yeah mm. Mm. creating an ecosystem you know because we all need each other tell me uh, how does agriculture onboard a farmer so what is the checklist that is needed from a farmer is, is there a specific size land that the farmer needs to have is it a specific crop um you know do they have to have i don't know records how, what's the process of onboarding a farmer who is seeking access to markets through agricool? Yeah, sure. Uh, obviously, we've just recently uh, started developing our platform, but ideally, once you're done, you'll list your products there, or you're going to fill in a form with some details, uh, the number of hectares, and then from there, we'll call you to verify that information before we allow you, your product to show on our marketplace. Uh, mm-hmm. But currently how we're doing, we do things conventionally. Some of the things I won't be able to mention, but it's the question that we ask farmers that will tell us how much they know about what they're doing. That's very important. Like, um, you know, when you call people, like you ask them, someone say you get someone calling, yeah, you know, I've, I've got peppers, I'm looking for access to markets. Like you ask them, uh, how many plants did you plant? How many hectares? You'll find someone say, yeah, there are 1,000 hectares. And like, yeah. <laughs> But they're a small scale farmer, and you could see that's not really you really find someone planting that much, not unless at a commercial, the commercial mm-hmm. scale. Um, so by looking at all those things, I mean it's those things that are data mining factor. But what happens is that a formal will give us a call. So we also have some applications online where we say we're looking for farmers with this uh, particular product line, or fill in the forms or call them. So what product line do you have? What var- or what, what cultivar did you plant? When did you plant it? When are you expecting to harvest? Some of those things they give us, to, at least they give us an idea to know if the farmer is knowing what they're taking. We, how far are you? And do you have mm-hmm. logistic or you don't want us to organize a third party? Should our buyers be interested in, in a product line? And then from there, depending with the size of the farm and the size of the product that you have, you can send us pictures. If you're interested enough, buyers are interested, 
you know, do our quality verification where we can drive, come to the farm, look at the quality, if it's good, and then if the buyer's interested, then we'll link you with the buyer. And uh, how we've also pivoted a bit is that we no longer buy and sell produce. We just link you directly with the farmer and the buyer, then we'll take a small commission. It will then charge an admin fee for organizing transports. It depends. You do have transport internally, uh, like your four-ton trucks. But uh, if maybe it's a 30-ton truck, we obviously we don't have that. We're not a logistic company, like uh, a transport company. So we can get that through our third party. Right. Explain that once again. So basically, you're no longer having the relationship directly with the farmer. You're just the connector between the buyer and the farmer. So a farmer today has products, let's say a ton of butternut. They list it on AgriCool. And it, does a client directly buy on the AgriCool platform? Um, or would you facilitate that relationship to say, Farmer Mbali, drop your butternut at point X, which is client X, and uh, you as agriculture will just charge a commission. Just explain that. Okay, sure. The 100%. Yeah, firstly, um, we still have relationships with our farmers and the buyers. Um, I always tell uh, our stakeholders, uh, uh, our the, the agriculture team, that we are in a business of facilitating relationships. That's what we do. We don't sell fresh produce, just facilitate relationship. We're just more like a dating site for, for farmers and buyers. So mm-hmm. what happened is that, uh, firstly, um, when a farmer or any buyer, when they buy product, they'll have to be at a farm gate price. So, mm-hmm. like, what you're trying to do is to help farmers uh, do what they do best and we take care of the rest, which is the sales and marketing of fresh produce. Right. So, if maybe you're selling your butternut currently, let's say 35 friend per 7 kg, because butternut is quite high, uh, 35 to 8, 38. So, mm-hmm. Let's, let's say maybe your farm gate price is 30 rand. Let's just make an example. So a buyer will then say, hey, I'm interested in that butternut. Then we'll tell them where are you, depending where the, the, the geographic location of the buyer, we'll then tell them, listen, for us to bring this, this butternut here, it'll cost you 32 rand. Maybe it's cost two rand uh, per bag. Yeah. So it costs you 32 rand to transport. So then, uh, then the buyer will tell us um, whether they can provide transport to come and collect from the farm. Or maybe we can organize um, transport on the behalf of the, buyer, of the buyer. But ideally what happens is that if a farmer has transport, we ask them if, uh, if you have partner that say 35 friend, are you going to deliver? Does that include delivery or is it a farm gate price? Mm-hmm. If it's a farm gate price, it means the buyer will have to organize and pay, take care of the trunk, uh, mm-hmm. or pay for, for transportation cost, cover transportation costs rather. It seems like a very transparent system. You already know as a farmer how much you'd be getting uh, agricultural, how much your cut will be and the buyer hundred percent and i think that's the more that's the biggest uh, our value proposition to the farmers because you know when you take your produce to other markets especially your traditional municipal markets you don't know even when you call people if you get employees to come and help you to harvest you kind of even factor in but if you know that your farm gate is steady and you're selling one thousand units that's thirty thousand you could see and say okay this is good i can get this number of workers and i'll pay each this amount and i'll pay for transport if you're delivering to that place at yeah. least it's very transparent and um why we've, we've people turn into this model is that when you speak to the farmers, everyone is interested to sell to the buyer directly. And the buyer is interested to buy from, from, uh, from a farmer directly. And, um, and one of the reasons I know a company called Twiga, and uh, they argue that uh, one of the reasons why food is so expensive is because there are a lot of middlemen in between. And again, when you look at uh, Africa, we spend uh, more than 35% of our household income, disposable income on food. And that's not good because imagine if you're spending 35% of your disposable income on food, um, what happens to the other 65%? And also in America, they probably spend less than 10%. That's why they can do entertainment. That is why they can invest in health. So we don't think we should be spending so much on food because food is a necessity anyway. So maybe that's what you're trying to do. By linking a buyer and a farmer directly, uh, you eliminating uh, double handling or multiple handling, which is helping for food losses, and also you eradicating a number of middlemen in between, which is mean we help farmer uh, sell at good prices, and you help farmer make more and help a buyer pay less. Yeah. Wow, fantastic. You know, Zamagutle, I heard you heard talk about emerging growers, etc. And, you know, a lot of the farmers right now are, look, are looking for additional markets uh, where they can sell their fresh produce. And I know that the municipal traditional markets have had quite a tough 
a uh, couple of few weeks, as opposed to where, you know, um, the onion prices as well as the potato prices have completely dropped because stock has been piling at the municipal markets. We've had yeah. load shedding and so forth. Um, and so I just want to find out, are you seeing an uptake in farmers uh, registering their products on Agricool? And where does the market currently, what does the market look like with regards to trading fresh produce? Yeah, sure. Um, well, I always say um, um, I can never have a specific answer to, to that question. Yeah. Um, I get a lot of people saying, I want to plant, what should I plant? And I always run away from answering that question. I'll tell you, because you have to look at your market as well. I'll just make an example. Um, you've got places, I know a farmer uh, in, in Peter Marisbeck. Um, he knows that in winter, uh, in his area, like where his farm is located, relatively in winter, Peter Marisbeck is very cold, so you'll struggle to plant your potatoes and other summer crops. But for him, because he knows that farm, uh, it's relatively warm in winter, so he plants potatoes. And uh, especially around um, August, early August, uh, up until first week of November, he's the only one with potatoes in PMB, in, K in that part of KZN, like in Peter Marisbeck and surrounding areas. So I think it's a matter of understanding and look at the market. And one thing that farmers need to understand is that your goal should always be the first one in the, in the market. Mm. So that is why you also need to take that risk if you can and say, you know what, I'm not too sure whether we're going to have frost or if you start planting um, maybe on the 1st of September, for example, you can just push and start uh, a week earlier that will give you a competitive advantage at the markets because you will be the egg, will be the first at the market. Possibly there won't be enough supply because most of your neighboring farmers, uh, they couldn't plant and they could not take that risk. And in that week alone, if you have enough supply, you can even make up. So when everyone starts to harvest already, you've already covered, say, your, what you've already spent on when you're planting with the cost for agri-inputs and, and other stuff as well. So mm -hmm. I'd say it depends on, yeah. And again, uh, we've noticed as well, the reason why we're also raising funding from, 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 from investors, that's why I'm, I'm kept on today to raise funding. So what also happened is that um, what I've noticed is that we look at our revenue, uh, we've got a curvature. So we're trying to flatten that curve because in winter, our farmers can't do butternut, potatoes, broccoli, and many other product lines. So but when you look at the guys in Pumalang and Limpopo, they can do that. Yes. So meaning if we can scale and go to those provinces, at least we can flatten that curve because... We can source those produce and be able to supply them in Peter Murray's back. Absolutely. So, yeah. So, I mean, it's very difficult to answer and say, listen, this is what you should plant. But, mm -hmm. I mean, we know, um, like, we, it's what, I mean, our, it's what's the silly season where there's a high demand for fresh produce. Already, our, our phone is always ringing, always busy. So, we could tell that there, there's a high demand. But, I mean, usually, you are really to, you're, you're really losing this time of the year, especially in December, that you make sure that your timing is right as well. Mm, mm. As much as you're assisting a lot of farmers and you've, you've come up with such an open and innovative business model, uh, tell us what are some of the drawbacks of dealing with farmers? So what, is, what, some of, what are some of the challenges that you as agriculture are experiencing when working uh, with farmers at this stage? Yeah, um, firstly, I'd say um, we, need, we need another day. To have, we need to have a podcast for that topic. But um, yeah, so... <laughs> But I'll try and summarize. You do a lot. Of, I'll just talk about uh, specifically black, black emerging growers. Because to be honest, we do sometimes get some of the deals where a retailer comes to us and says, listen, guys, we love what you guys are doing. We love that you know where to find growers. Can you guys help us procure from black farmers? But the problem would be that um, they need to try and strengthen on their business development to understand how they do business. They need to, they need to look at market trends. I mean, you do not design, you're selling a commodity. You don't wake up in the morning and decide what price you're going to sell at a commodity at. Look at market prices. Look at fuel. I mean, it is uh, like diesel costs close to 20 rands a liter. I'm not sure if that's still the case. It's been a while since I went to refuel. But I, I, you don't just say it's 15 rand. I want to I wanna buy at 14 rand or I want to sell the garage. It, it's commodity. It's, it, depends on a, it depends on the demand and supply. It's the same thing. Farmers, emerging growers need to understand that. I mean, the market doesn't care how much you spend when you're planting. Unfortunately, that's the sad part of it. Mm -hmm. And another again, I mean, one thing that people need to understand, it's the farmer, it's agriculture, and it's the buyer. It's mm -hmm. agriculture, when we do business development, one thing that people need to understand that a business is a group of people following processes and systems. Mm -hmm. That's the definition of a business. So if you do not have systems, unfortunately, we can go as far as going to a farm gate. That is why we say it's a farm gate price. 
you only get involved at the farm. We, we only want the produce at the gates. I don't care what happens afterwards. I don't care if your workers did not arrive on time. That's your own baby. That's your own logistics that you have to deal with. So farmers need to, to be plain and know if I, wanna, if I want to, to harvest a thousand heads of cabbage within an hour, these are the number of people that I need. If I want to get broccoli or cauliflower planted, this, so if, because one thing that they need to understand, I also wish sometimes when you do these deliveries, we should go with, we could go with the farmer. So they will see what happens. So they could see the entire value chain. So they could see when we're not getting stock on time, what disruption it make along the agri value chain. Because one thing that you guys, we, we do with this is, a DC still needs to uh, redistribute to the outlets, small outlets. Like, for example, let me make an example, like food lovers. They've got other outlets. So what this means is that if you are a farmer, maybe the farm, let's say the, the, the truck, that truck needs to leave uh, the distribution center at 10 o'clock. If they say they want stock at 10, and as are you cool, we know how long it takes for us to, if, from your farm to the DC. So if you say by nine o'clock or maybe by seven o'clock, have the stock ready for us. Mm. You should make sure that's the case. Because once you start messing that up, you are, you're also messing up a relationship that other farmers could have benefited from it. So I think mm. farmers need to do the systems, need to do the planning. When I talk about the system, when you're cutting, you need to know who's cutting. You need to know who's doing quality control. Just in case, if the stock is rejected, if I tell you that, sorry, 30% of your broccoli or cauliflower or tomatoes were rejected, at least you know who's accountable. You need that accountability. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, we actually have a question here from Donald uh, Shoka, and uh, they say, which one generates steady jobs? Is it commercial or subsistence farming? Sorry, I, I, I didn't get the question. Which one? So the question here is, which one generates more steady jobs? Is it commercial or subsistence farming? So which type of farming or at which scale um, of farming creates more subsistence jobs? Is it more or sorry, creates more uh, steady Table. jobs. Yeah. Or commercial farmers. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, obviously the answer to that would be commercial because it's, it's more established. And I mean, once you get to a commercial level, you even get to a point where you're trying to make sure that you can supply continuously, even other, they even have grain because they want to make sure that they can have their workers working throughout the season or throughout the year. But I mean, not, uh, not to say that there isn't a role that is played by small growers, because, you know, especially in Africa, in Africa, uh, agriculture employs like a huge population. So, mm. and uh, when you look at other countries, uh, not South Africa, and especially in, uh, in the other countries in the SEDEC, you'll see that um, it's more small scale farmers than 80% uh, of Africa's food come from, from small growers. And uh, unfortunately, in South Africa, you look at the market, our market is quite different. I just make an example as well, looking at, at the market, you will see that um, in South Africa, we've got roughly, I'd say, say 30% informal market, 70% formal market. Whereas when you look at other countries like Kenya, it's other way around, where it's more informal than formal. So that is why we look at startup like your Twiga because they work with the hawkers. It's a very big markets because they have it that way. Where else? It's other way. Same here in South Africa. Um, we've got a, the big we've got big commercial farmers who create a lot of employment opportunities. So mm -hmm. that's the case with uh, with small growers as well. But I'd say commercial they create more steady because they've got systems, they've got planning, and again, which also ties to what you've just uh, talked about. Yeah, you know, access to market is a big, big thing for a lot of farmers, whether established or just a startup farmer, particularly with the farmers that you've dealt with. Let's say they're listening tonight, right? What are some of the tips and advantages that you would provide to the farmers when seeking access to market? You know, because I also get these questions where people are like saying, I've started planting, but I don't have market or I've got uh, basil as, as a herb. Mm -hmm. I don't have market. How do I pursue market? So. Um, you know, for those that are currently supplying into agriculture and those that are listening that wish to start supplying to agriculture, what are some of the tips that you would advise to farmers when seeking access to markets? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, obviously, firstly, I'd say as agriculture, when we started, we started as a company that was supplying our hawkers. And the reason behind that is that there was no bureaucracy. And I still think, obviously, as agriculture, we're only based in Kedren and Peter Morrisbeck. We're only serving local farmers for now until we can raise funding, maybe we can scale to other provinces. Mm -hmm. uh, until then, I'd say a farmer that we can't help because of geographic location, they need to start small and target the informal market. Obviously, look at what the informal market is doing. Like they don't do herbs, 
they don't do your high uh, some high value crops so they only do like your cabbage your spinach your cash crops that are that everyone knows so as a farmer i'd say just go to them start small even if you do a thousand hits start small and say okay guys i'm going to plant cabbage they all it's an open market it's, a, it's an open market it's a very easy market like they're very willing to to help to buy from farmers and from there grow from there, learn from that. They'll give you feedback as well because they've been in the game for years. You find hawkers, they've been uh, uh, selling fresh produce for more than 30, 40 years. They'll mm -hmm. tell you, you know what, for us, you want the size. This is not the good quality. At least you will learn. And the school fees, you will pay a very small school fees. Unlike uh, when you try to target a big retailer first, it will be difficult because of the bureaucracy around compliance. And secondly, should they give you a chance and you mess up, it'll be mm -hmm. very difficult for you to come back again. Mm. so yeah it'll be very difficult because i mean they'll judge you i mean uh you are as good as your last delivery mm. yes. uh, so we have a question here and i think maybe this might be slightly out of your um uh preferred crop if i could put it that way uh prince says prince mazabugo says is ganja farming legal i want to look at doing it for commercial i, I want to look at doing it commercial for oils, et cetera. So I suppose ganja is uh, cannabis farming. Is that correct? Yeah, I think so too. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't, have, um, I don't have any information on that. Uh, yeah, yeah, because you specifically deal with fresh produce. But I think for Prince, yeah. that yeah, I know that cannabis farming, uh, there, there must be some licenses. I think we did a, a podcast around cannabis farming. So if you could check on our YouTube channel, uh, Farming Podcast Playlist, there was um, a podcast that we did around cannabis farming. So you have to have a license as that. Um, so yeah, I think if you could check out onto that uh, podcast, I think you would find more detail. So some would say, you know what, uh, just speaking to you, I could just tell that you've grown as an entrepreneur, you've grown as an agripreneur in the fresh produce. You kind of understand, you know, what your clients want because you've now diversified not on, only to informal markets, but now you're selling retail, DC. You have to operate in, in terms of they, the way in which they need to operate because they've got stores that they need to manage and deal with, right? And then the other spectrum as well, you've also identified some of the draw, drawbacks um, slash opportunities that farmers are not taking advantage of where market is concerned, meaning approaching more informal markets. Farmers are not really looking at their business as they farms as like a business, creating systems in place that when they say, Agricool, I'm going to harvest a thousand heads of cabbage, you know, they need to meet that. So I can see that you've changed and grown as an entrepreneur. And also you've kind of seen the industry uh, right now and also experienced its frustrations. So, Having said that, what is the solution to the problems that you've experienced? So in hindsight, what I'm trying to ask is where to from here, right? As agriculture, you're saying you're in Cape Town, you're seeking for additional funding. If you can disclose, um, where would that funding go to? Is it funding to maybe expand to other regions so that you could get farmers in Mpumalanga and Limpopo, more hotter regions or opposite regions as to KZN? Um, is the funding maybe to buy trucks so that a lot of the farmers that you have in your pool can have access to logistics. So yeah, where's agriculture going uh, from now on? Okay, sure. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Uh, firstly, um, our vision as agriculture is to become Africa's sourcing hub for food and agri products. So yeah. whatever that you can think of. So in as much as we are doing our fresh produce, we are also now uh, trying to work with one of the big food manufacturing companies in, in Africa. We uh, the, uh, in South Africa, sorry, they buy 70% uh, of, of the grain in South Africa. So we're trying to work with them. So by saying that, I'm trying to also, in as much as you're working with fresh produce, you also want to start doing grain as well in our platform. So our platform, we want to allow people to do fresh produce, to do grain. And also by saying food, even if it gets to a point where you're selling meats, but you've got license, obviously, and proper infrastructure, you can list on our platform. So we want to get to to a, to, a, to, a, to, a, to a level where we're doing export, especially now that you would know that there's a buzz around your free Afri or African continental free trade, free trade agreement. So you want to leverage it, leverage that so we can have uh, our intra-African trade. And mm -hmm. uh, on the funding side, um, we are raising because you want to scale to, we, we haven't decided yet where we would go. Uh, we're still looking and see which one will be looking at, because uh, you know, one of the challenges 
in agriculture is that uh, key uh, stakeholders like uh, they're operating in silence. Like you find that logistic is on its own, the market is on its own, agri input is on its own. So that's what makes farming a little bit difficult. It's so fragmented. So even when you scale to that particular province, you also need to look at the accessibility of transportation. So the money that you're raising, we're not raising to buy more trucks. It's just for operations uh, mm -hmm. to do develop our technology because we would like to streamline. Because you know we've got a couple of farmers in PMB and surrounding areas. It's easy to deal with them on WhatsApp and with our MVP. But once you scale to other provinces, once you do more PR, like every as we talk to you, so we need we need to make ease of trade. We need to make it easy, to ease to, to, so that it's easy for us to onboard those farmers to our platform. Wow. Thank you so much, Samogusha, for your time this evening. I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation. And I know that you're going to do big things because, you know, the private property team follows you on social media. And that's how we were able to track to say, wow, you know, he won an award. He's doing amazing. We can see that the team is growing. We can see as well that you as a business person has grown with the posts that you constantly share, you know, um, uh, with uh, inspirational quotes around business and just the way you're looking at your business. And I'm glad that you're thinking broad um, outside South African borders you're looking at you know targeting africa as well um, i definitely think there's a huge scale in the fresh produce industry and also going into grain production uh you know because food is a priority and i think a lot of farmers also need to step up the game work with businesses like yourself because at the end of the day you know farmers are farmers and that i feel personally that our job should be focused on the field you know, and let the salespeople do what they do best, logistics people do what they do best. And that's how you create a seamless and operational uh, value chain, you know. So, yeah, thank you for your time this evening. Any last words before you go? Yeah, sure. Um, I think you've just said it, um, especially on like the advice that gives to farmers, even if you're doing it at a small scale. Like, um, you know, I'll just make an example with us as Agricool. What has been hindering us from scaling was that I was so much involved in the operations of the business. I'd be the one who drive the truck. As soon as I empowered myself to say, listen, I'm a CEO, I need to work on the vision. I need to just go and get more business. That's how the business grew. So it's the same thing with the farmers. Our goal is to help you concentrate on what you do best, which is farming. If you can, you can just be a farm manager and have people working for you. By doing so, and also give us an opportunity to help you with selling your product. By doing so, you'll see that you, you'll get some time to work on your, um, mm. on your, on your business uh, development side of your agribusiness. Mm. So I'd really advise what you've just said. Right. Thank you so much. That was um, okay. from AgriCool, the founder or co-founder of AgriCool. And we're talking about access to markets for farmers. He's currently working directly with farmers, procuring uh, fresh produce and uh, connecting the farmer basically with the buyer. So it's quite a transparent process. They just simply charge a commission and an admin fee. So go on to their website, AgriCool, um, and you can check out um, all the information in terms of what they do. And you as a farmer could register your farm online onto their platform. And um, yeah, I think get going with, your, with trading your produce. You can see that is quite a, a, a passionate entrepreneur. So I believe that when you contact AgriCool, you'll be in the right hands. They will take you through every step of the way in terms of onboarding your fresh produce onto the platform, understanding the varieties, the quantities that you'll be selling, when you'll be harvesting, and they could link you up with the right buyer within that region. Yet again, AgriCool is predominantly based in KZN, Peter Maritzburg. So if you're farming that region, I suggest you go on to AgriCool if you're struggling with markets but if you missed this episode you can catch it on our youtube channel private property under the farming podcast playlist and yeah thank you so much to donald and prince for your question i hope we were able to answer them with uh, great satisfaction on your end and um please continue to like comment and share and uh keep supporting the podcast well that's it for me tonight good god bless and take care <laughs>